So please welcome Mary Ann Wayman. I'm still going to mess up. <laughs> Hi, everybody. It's so good to see you all. It's been a long time since Robin and I've been here. Um, I'd like to thank the group from the DC area for also helping with this event. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about why you should be your own advocate. Let's see if I got it. There you go. I think I'm, I can't read that one. Okay. Um, we, um, before we get started, um, why you should be an advocate and a patient advocate. Um, we are helping patients with issues that people have in, that affect their health. A patient advocate also helps resolve issues about health care and other issues related to their medical condition, um, you know, support, education, and things like that. Um, and advocates also bring public awareness and the importance of the cancer issues. Um, back in 2001, when I first got diagnosed after being misdiagnosed for seven years, um, you know, back then there was only the Costanoid Cancer Foundation. There really wasn't any other real groups. Um, we had several support groups, but not many. Um, across the country. There was no zebra, there was no neck cancer day, there was no real conferences or anything like that. Um, and Robin and I are very proud of the fact that we were able to help bring this to issue to the forefront. Like I said, my journey, seven years of searching, seven doctors, seven colonoscopies, seven endoscopes. All of them came back, nothing. They kept on saying, oh, you have little polyps, if we leave it, it'll turn into cancer, let's take them out. And finally, I went to see a GI doctor who thought outside of a box. And he said, did anybody ever use a pediatric scope on you? And I looked at the man and said, are you crazy? I said, I'm in my 30s. What are you talking about? And he said, it's longer and more flexible. He said, I can get into that ileum, and I believe that's where your tumor is. And sure enough, he was right. So my journey, my journey is not unusual. I get calls every single day saying, you're never going to believe what happened to me. I do believe it because I've been there and I've listened to your stories over and over again. We answer the phone seven days a week, 365 days a year. Robert and myself and my daughter answer the phone. When you call, you do not get a secretary. You do not get somebody reading off a script. If you need 15 minutes, I give you 15 minutes. If you need two hours, I give you two hours. So please use that hotline because it's very important that you get the support that you need. You know, um, knowing about your diagnosis is also very important. Know what your diagnosis is, where your tumor is, what your tumor, op uh, what your treatment options are. Um, speak up for yourself. If you feel that a doctor is not giving you the answers that you need, make sure you bring a list of questions. Give it to the nurse and say, if he can't answer them right now, can he get to them later on? Can somebody get back to me? And um, you know, by going and doing these, speaking up for yourself and being an advocate for yourself, you have a better chance of having a better outcome and a longer life. Here's the three reasons why you need to advocate for yourself. One, not all doctors know neuroendocrine. Most doctors, unless they specialize in this disease, will only see one or two patients in their lifetimes. They will say, yes, I've heard of it, and they'll go on the computer when you're out of the room and look it up. <laughs> find yourself that knows somebody that, find somebody, find a doctor that knows what they're talking about. And if you can't, and you need to see a local doctor, make sure you get the resources to help educate that doctor. Call ISI and get their book call NCCN, go to a specialist once in your lifetime, go to a specialist, have them work up a program. Um, so this way you're getting the proper treatment. Um, can't even see it. <laughs> okay. So um, that's okay. <laughs> you can help yourself by um, sharing these misconceptions uh, mis uh, mis and they're common. And that, you know, a lot of physicians believe that once the tumor is removed, no follow-up is needed. That's not true. Everybody needs to be followed up. That um, you should, um, there is no treatment options. That's not true. We have treatment options. Years ago, there was only one treatment. Now there are hundreds of treatments. All right, maybe not hundreds, but at least 50. <laughs> 
um, you know, and um, especially surgeons remove the surgery, uh, re remove the tumor, and then they say no follow up is needed. Get yourself an oncologist. Get yourself an endocrinologist. Get yourself a surgeon. Get yourself a GI doctor. Get yourself a heart doctor. Go for your echoes. Go for your um, stress tests. Go to every doctor you can. If you are a female, go to your GYN. Go and get your breast exam. Go and get whatever you need to get done. If you're a male, go for your prostate. This disease can spread to other organs. And a lot of times, people ignore, because they're so focused on the carcinoid and the net, they ignore their bodies for other things. And then it's too late. So please do yourself a favor and follow up on your net special, uh, your net test, and also other test. Okay, reason number two: effective treatments do exist. New diagnostic and therapies are available. We've seen a lot of new t things coming um, in the last year or so, and we have a whole bunch more coming in the future. How can I make sure that these uh, treatments are available, like the gallium-68, the PRRT, I can't read, uh, the um, Zomelo. Uh, there's a bunch of clinical trials, which we're going to hear today from NIH, which we're really excited about. But find out about it. Go online. Be proactive. Speak to the experts. Go to your support group meetings. People. You go online and do the Facebook groups, which is wonderful. But honestly, the fact of the matter is you learn more by sitting in a room at a support group meeting or at one of these meetings. You can sit at home and watch the live feeds of certain conferences, but you're not absorbing it as much as you are when you're sitting right here and now. So try to attend as many events as possible and listen to the experts and listen to what they have to say because they're going to help save your life. Note, many nets secrete various hormones. I'm not going to go into the hormones. That's not my job. <laughs> Reason number three, save your life by making sure that you're getting the best treatment possible. Again, make sure that you check to make sure that your doctor knows what he's talking about. If he doesn't, get to a specialist. Go one time, get a program going, get the ISI book, they send them to the doctors for free, get the NCC and guidelines, get the NANET guidelines, um, go to, um, everybody usually buys a gift for their oncologist for Christmas, why not order them a NANET um, membership for them to go and join NANET so they can keep up to date. These are things that you can do to help your doctor make sure that you're being treated. Make sure you continue networking, keep learning, follow up with your doctors, reach out to the neck cancer specialist, ask a lot, a lot of questions. And if you're, getting, you're not getting what you need, it may be time to find another doctor. Don't be afraid to fire your doctor. Remember, you do not work for the doctor, the doctor works for you. And I don't care if it's the number one specialist in the world or if it's some local oncologist on the bottom, you need to find what's best for you. And I'm going to give you a perfect example. I went to one of the top specialists in the world who nearly killed me because I got, he offered me a treatment that my regular oncologist said no to, and I said no to. And I had talked to one of the top specialists in Europe who also said, don't ever take that drug, you'll be dead in six months. So I don't care who the doctor is. You need to find the right doctor for you personality, their education, and things like that. So each one of us, it's different. Our disease is different. You need to find the right fit for you. So what inspired us to become advocates? I'm a little crazy. <laughs> it's clear that neuroendocrine patients needed help. In 2001, when I did get diagnosed, um, at the time, there was only the Carcinoid Cancer Foundation. They answered the phone Tuesday through Thursday at the time from 10 to 4. Of course, when did I get diagnosed? Thursday evening at 5 o'clock. So what's the first thing when you get diagnosed? What's the first thing you do? You go to the computer and you start reading information on the computer. Computer said I was going to be dead in five years. Well, here I am 25 plus years later. I'm still here and I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> We knew that the patients needed a place to talk, to get facts, 
and to have somebody understand exactly what they were going through. There is nothing better than sitting in a room with a bunch of people who understand your disease. Okay? I want to just take a quick survey. How many people are newly diagnosed, have been diagnosed less than a year? How many have been diagnosed two to five years? How many have been diagnosed five to seven years? How many have been diagnosed seven to 12 years? And how many have been diagnosed over 19 years? See, this is a pretty good crowd. If I look back at 2001 when I read that computer and it said I was gonna be dead in five years, I would never have dreamt that I was gonna be standing right here and looking at my fellow patients and knowing that they're here over 20 years. So that's a big, big feat for you. We remember that the journey was very long and exhausting. Like I said, seven years, seven doctors. I needed answers. I had doctors tell me I had ear valves. I had doctors tell me I had Crohn's disease. I had doctors tell me that I had ulcerated colitis. I had doctors to tell me that I was absolutely crazy, that there was nothing wrong with me. It was all in my head. But I think the one that hit me the most was Robert and I were sitting in a doctor's office as he's holding my hand, and the doctor turned around to Robert and said, you need to go to a marriage counselor. And Robert said, excuse me? And he said, you need to go to a marriage counselor because your marriage is bad and that's why these symptoms are happening. And I turned around to that doctor and I said, if my marriage was so bad, why is my husband sitting here for seven years holding my hand, going to every doctor's appointment, every hospital visit, every hospital stay? You're the one that's crazy, not me. So after being diagnosed, I wrote a letter to each and every doctor that I saw. And I said, I'm not suing you for malpractice, but what I'm sending you is the information. I'm sending you the guidelines. I'm sending you the information that if any patient comes to you with these symptoms, please do not block it out of your head. Please think of carcinoid, because you might just save somebody's life. Believe it or not, out of seven doctors, I got three responses thanking me, because they had no idea that this even existed. We also had a patient who was diagnosed in our group, and her son was a dermatologist. He had been treating the patient for many, many years for rosacea, and the patient never was improving, and he couldn't understand why. And his mom got diagnosed with carcinoid, and he started doing reading, and all of a sudden he went back to this patient and said, I'm gonna run some blood tests just for the hell of it. He said, because your rosacea isn't getting any better, and I really, I'm at a loss for words. I don't know what to do with you. And the woman said, okay, I'll do it, and turned out all the blood markers came back high, she ended up having a colonoscopy, and it turned out she did have metastatic carcinoid of her small intestines that nobody picked up on. And here was a dermatologist whose mother just happened to get the disease, and he happened to find it. So then he went back and he started looking at all his patients with rosacea, and he found two other patients with it. Had his mother not been diagnosed, that patient might not be here today. And this patient is still alive 10 years later. So this is why it's very important. Um, so, in 2003, we created NCAN. In 2002, we started this, we took over the support group on Long Island. We now are considered NCAN, the Neuroendocrine Cancer Awareness Network. Um, we started, um, you could say that we started by making lemonade out of lemons. And um, I was the winner of the 2010 Monica Warner Advocacy Award and Mitch Berger isn't here yet, but Mitch won the award last year, and that's a very big honor. Uh, in 2016, I also won um, the ONN Hero of Hope Award, which was another great honor. Each year, we bring the community together. We do walks. Um, we do a walk in Long Island. We do a walk in Charlotte. We do a virtual walk. Um, we uh, have a really great turnout. Sometimes we have up to 800 people on Long Island. Some years it's 250, depending on how cold it is or if we're having a hurricane. <laughs> uh, we also hold galas, which is a celebration of life. And the gala we make reasonable because we want the patients to come and celebrate each year of their life. Um, World Net Cancer Day came about in 2009. Um, Novartis approached me because we had done Neck Cancer Awareness Month in November from 2006 on, and they said to me, would you be willing to help head up a program for the World Neck Cancer Day? 
And so Robert and I started in 2009 and we invited several countries and people from uh, all over the world to come and speak. And we started our first Net Cancer Day in 2010. That's something that we're really proud of. Um, we have done patient conferences. Um, we've done 70 conferences since 2003. This is a small conference. We do national conferences. We have over 500, 600 patients. And it's a three-day event, and it's, it's really amazing. And we could not do that without our specialists. We could not do that without them, because they're the ones that bring the information to you. Um, so we can continue our mission and help the community. We want to keep growing awareness. We want to keep uh, to patients physicians, general public. We have started doing CMEs for physicians. We're going to be doing a program later this year for nurses, and um, we're really excited about that. Um, and we want to help patients and families navigate their journey. Um, we are on social media. We have numerous Facebook pages. Um, we send out a free information packet to everybody that calls the office. It is a very, very in-depth um, information packet. It is from all the pharmaceutical information about all the drugs, the new tests coming out, also information from NCAN, and um, you could do that. You can call our hotline at the 866-850-9555. Um, Robert and I would be more than happy to speak to you. Uh, we sell awareness of uh, merchandise and stuff. Um, we have the conferences. We launched our new website um, last year. On there is a full glossary of of um, words that you need to know. It has question and answers on there. Um, we also have a database with videos from past conferences, probably over 100 videos, if not more, um, that you can watch the past conferences. And so take a look at that. Um, we're here to help and appreciate your support. Um, this would not be possible without the support of the pharmaceutical companies, which um, today was Novartis, Ipsen, and Lexicon that supported us. And without them, we could not do these programs. And each one of you that registered. <laughs> so there has been so much progress in the last five years. Um, we never thought that we would get this far. And um, you know, people say to me, oh, this is a rare disease. Honestly, I don't think we have touched the iceberg yet. I think this disease is underdiagnosed. We know for a fact that years ago, when I was doing data in 2001, that there was one out of every 100 autopsies done, there was a tumor in their, pan uh, in their uh, appendix. That has to be true today. So we're not rare. It's just we're underdiagnosed. So we need each and every one of you to go out and spread the word. I have a bracelet, I have a pin in your bags. I expect you to wear them. When you're standing online and somebody asks you a question about it, don't be shy about it. I know a lot of people don't want to talk about diarrhea or stomach pains or anything like that, but it is important because you never know who the next person it is that you're gonna save. So please make sure you spread the word. Be part of the solution and be your own advocate and advocate for each other and I want you to remember the caregivers. You know, looking around this room, you can't tell who the patient is and who the caregiver is. I have to be honest, there are a lot of caregivers that I see that look worse than the patient because they're so busy taking care of the patient. You caregivers, you need to remember this too. You have to take care of yourself. You have to follow up. Don't ignore your health issues because of your loved one. Remember to take care of yourself. So the future is so bright, I have to wear shades. So thank you all for being here. We truly appreciate it. Um, if you have any questions, please make sure that you come up and ask us. Um, you have question cards on the table. As the meeting goes on, you can write down a question. I'll be collecting them later on, and the doctors will answer as many as they can. Please try to keep the questions not case specific, like broad questions because they cannot answer your questions for you only okay and um, Robert thank you <laughs>